Hi everyone! It was some time back that I was lucky enough to have had the opportunity to interview Malaysia's first Olympic figure skater, Julian Yi. And yeah, today's video we will be discussing his experience during the Olympic qualifiers and in the Winter Olympic itself. With that being said, I hope that you all enjoy today's video. So yeah, so the, the first checklist, I usually have a checklist, the first thing I always check is number one, my skates and, and my, my music and my costume, right? These are the three things that the whole reason this trip is for, so I need to have those. Um, and then apart from that, it's just whatever other equipment that I have, for example, my foam roller, um, whatever physio tape, all those stuff that, you know, because I'm always there will always be something you never know if something happens to pull a muscle and all that so you just want to be on standby um, but besides that I mean it depends as well like when I was competing back then when I was still studying in secondary school and primary school um, I always had books with me for assignments uh, homework yeah because because <laughs> you know what because deadlines don't wait for you exactly deadlines don't wait for you you gotta get it done and hand it in so I I always had some some sort of work with me, um, and I think what's important is I think like everybody travel, you know, usual your your, your uh, earphones, you know, speaker, computer, standard stuff lah. It's best basically think of it this way like you go for a holiday, but with with skating equipment, except you don't really go on holiday. <laughs> So usually, um, for us, like in, in regular competitions, we would arrive the week of it. So let's say the competition starts on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that point in time. We would arrive normally Monday or Tuesday uh, because we will have assigned practice times there as well in the, in the arena we're going to compete in. Um, sometimes, like you said, across the world, time zone difference, we want to acclimatize to it. Um, but with Germany, I, I went a bit earlier. Uh, I went about a week earlier. A week earlier so I had one week and then the week of the competition started so all in all about two weeks by the end of the competition um, mainly because Oberstoff I've, I've been there already I think three or four times um, it, I, I knew that that was a competition that I had to go to qualify so I started early with it already every year um, plus my, my coach is also German so he had connections there for me to, to train there as well before the competition um, so it, it, it sort of worked out quite well. So yeah, I, I was there uh, a bit earlier, you know, to get used to to everything, to the time, uh, to the weather, and also Overstuff is also up in the mountains. So that's what we call um, the elevation is different, so it's harder to breathe, right? So so we want to get used to it a little bit more when it's high up. Yeah, the altitude. Not too bad actually. <laughs> Surprisingly, it was not too bad. Um, the one thing I do about every competition is I always visualize uh, at night. So I put on my earphones, I uh, close my eyes, I visualize myself in the arena competing with my program music on. So um, after like two, three times of going through, automatically you fall asleep. So <laughs> it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. It, it went to sleep. I mean, the stress was there, but at that time, when it was time to, to hit the sack, it was, it was not too bad. It actually was quite nice. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, visualize yourself, uh, self-talk. I think that, that really gives you the confidence. And a lot of times, it's, it doesn't matter what spot. If there's no music at all, just put on something you want to listen to. Or have it nice and quiet. Uh, play at the different scenarios of what could happen. Because a lot of times when we do sports, you have to think on your feet. And if you have played it out already in your mind, it's gonna kick in right away instead of you're gonna just get shot and you're stuck there. So, because you already thought of it before. So, that's one, one good thing for a lot of athletes. I celebrated more when I came back home. Uh, I was just more relieved at that time uh, because at, when, when I was in the qualifiers, I also had a, a, a camera crew with me doing a documentary. 
So the added pressure was there, knowing that there's like a whole bunch of cameras following you, uh, capturing every moment. And after I qualified the next day, I had to shoot some more, some more scenes. So it was like back to work in that sense because. Yeah, they didn't want to. They didn't want to shoot it before the competition because it's, it's really very stressful. So they thought, okay, you make it good, great, and then we'll do it after. So I had to redo some, some stuff there. Yeah, it. it I mean, at night, obviously, yeah, I just go with some friends, you know, celebrate a little bit. Um, but, but yeah, the, the next day was back to, to shooting and all that. But it was great. It was good. And then I came back. I uh, had, you know, just a few friends and family, celebrate a little bit. This and that. Yeah. It was, it was one great experience. Um, I'm not gonna lie. What was going through my mind was uh, not to drop the flag. Uh, <laughs> so I like, don't drop it. Don't drop. Keep your, keep your focus. Um, but at the same time, it was, it was quite interesting to see how everything worked behind the scenes. Um, most of the time, we Olympics, we always watch TV, right? Uh, unless you're, you're lucky enough. You be able to afford it to go to the venue, buy tickets for the Olympic ceremony, which is great. Uh, but my honest opinion is, if you watch it on TV, you get a better view because <laughs> you can see everything. If you're there in the stadium, it's more for the experience, but you don't see as much. Uh, but us being athletes behind the scenes, I I didn't get to see anything at all because everything was happening while we were in the waiting room, lining up to come out. So by the time we came out with the flags. It, the ceremony was almost over, but again, it was good because you know we get to mix with other people from different countries. We're exchanging pins and all that, so it was it was really um, a very unique experience. And it was fun, yeah, very very fun. No, no, I know for the for much past, right? You're holding. Uh, it's not quite like that. Think of it this way, the March Pass flag is actually very very light. <laughs> and very very small. This is the real deal, this is big, it's heavy. Uh, I was not expecting it to be this heavy, but boy, it was, it was, it was, quite, it was quite heavy. And then to wave it as you walk, oh my. It was, quite, it was quite stressful as well, but it was fun, like I said. Uh, walking out, stadiums were fully lit. Um, you, can't, you can't really see the audience in there because there's so much light. So I thought I was walking into an empty stadium, uh, but as I got closer, I could see more people. So it's a little bit more realistic after that. It was, yeah, it was, it was nice. It was, it was, it was nice that Astro actually also aired it on TV. <laughs> it's definitely a very interesting experience. Um, think of it this way: so the Olympic Village itself, at least for this this Olympics, it was newly built apartment buildings. So imagine a whole apartment complex with different, different buildings. Um, and the whole place, the whole entire compound of, I don't know, 10 buildings all the way, that's the entire village. And we had two villages, one that is down the mountain, one that is up in the mountain. So those that are up in the mountain are the skiing, snowboarding, ski jump. Those below are all the ice sports. Um, so basically what we do is each each country is designated um, a section in the village. Uh, Malaysia only has a very small team, so we only had one apartment room, uh, one unit uh, basically, and then like Korea, USA, Canada, they had the whole building for themselves. Yeah, because they have a big team. Um, so what we do is we decorate our own our own rooms with our flags and so it's really cool to see the different flags you know okay this is team Canada this is team USA team Japan um, and then what we do is th there are a lot of different communal areas there so we have like a, a games room where there's like pool table uh, air hockey foosball some arcade stuff uh, a little sitting area lounge to just chill out with other athletes and then we have our our, our canteen which is this huge hall of food. Um, everything is free, so it's like basically like a think of it as a giant buffet lah. Um, there's all sorts of food that you want: halal food, non-halal, kosher, um, seafood, meats, vegetable, vegetarian, vegan. Um, but the best part was McDonald's because that was also there. 
yeah, uh, McDonald's is the is the official it's the official sponsor of the Olympics. So um, there was a McDonald's there with a, a limited menu. We had our usual cheeseburger, quarter pounder, um, I think McChicken, chicken nuggets, and again it's free. So uh, uh, that was my highlight there. I enjoyed McDonald's so much <laughs> because it's free. So every day I had chicken nuggets. Um, but unfortunately, that's the last year that McDonald's was the official sponsor. So from now on, every other Olympics, there's no more McDonald's. So I was very lucky. I experienced the last McDonald's. Uh, but yeah, so so that's how it is with food. And then, like you said, sometimes in some different places, there are snacks and all that. Um, vending machine uh, with Coca-Cola um, products in there, like Powerade and all that, also free. Uh, but yeah, it was very unique. No. <laughs> no. It's, it's honestly for me, it was less stressful. It was less stressful for me because the, the biggest stress was to get to the Olympics. So, Tobusov was the decision maker, right? Um, whereas at the Olympics, I was already there, I qualified already, I got in. For me, that was the goal. My goal wasn't to make it to the finals. It would be great if I did. That would be awesome, it would be a bonus. But sometimes, like I said, you can't be too greedy. Um, I got, I achieved my goal. I was happy with that. Whatever that's after was a bonus for me. And it's not like I just gave, like didn't care anything, didn't train at all. I still train as much as I can, you know, put in as much. Um, and when I competed there at the Olympics for my shop program, I actually got the, my best score for the season. So it was actually better than what I did in Oberstdorf. Um, but unfortunately, it just, yeah, it just wasn't, it was like one point away. Um, so I didn't make it to the finals. But, you know, like I said, I, I was happy that I made it that far. Um, no regrets. I did what I can, I did my best. That's as much as I can do, right? And uh, yeah, so I, I just enjoyed my time there. Definitely. Um, realistic goals is what actually brings you closer to what you want. Uh, it's good to dream. That's great. Um, but if you if you dream too big and there's no way you're gonna get it, you, you, like you know, one in a billion chances, right? How often are you the one in a million? You know, when people buy a lottery, how often that person is gonna win? So it's it's better to set something that you are able to control. Because when you're in control, you, you know your progress, you know how to get there. It's a little bit more, as you mentioned, realistic. So for me, realistic goals is, is definitely a key point. And again, don't get me wrong, it's not like you can't dream. Dream big. Just make sure you know where, where your, your level is, where your standard is. And then from there, you slowly work, step by step. If, if you set small steps, it will gradually go up to there. Right? You want to go on like a, a step and not just shoot straight up because it, shooting straight up is, is not impossible but it's very difficult right whereas if you create small steps eventually slowly but eventually you get there and you can see progress if you try to jump straight away up there's nothing to to gauge right it's like all of a sudden it just happens no it's like if a tree grows it doesn't just grow from 1 cm to 100 meters Eventually, it slowly gets there, and, and then from there you can see halfway. If something goes wrong, then you, okay, you can reevaluate, right? So small goals in between small steps. That's that's fun. I I for me when I chose that song, especially Seven Nation Army, Highway to Hell, and Kings and Queens, I just wanted to have fun. I wanted to, to involve the audience as well, you know, to to be after all like i said it's a performing sport so to to get them pumped up a little bit more excited you know because like you say a lot of skaters use more classical more gentle music you know the usual the, the, the usual skating music it's nice to change it up a little bit gets gets them a little bit more interested you know especially the younger generation um, i find that if we use music that can relate to them a little bit more we're going to get more audiences people are going to be more interested in the sport um, and also just to change it up for the judges a little bit, you know, because they sit there for the whole day 
listening to similar or you know that kind of genre of music and give them something a little bit more to, to wake up um, and just have fun for me honestly that program was just to engage with the audience have fun let everybody be a part of um, the performance in Sunway in Sunway we had this uh, when I started skating we had this one janitor there right um, super nice guy um, Ironically, he's from Bangladesh, uh, but and he used to he on his day off he would come back and skate, right? So I thought, oh, that's quite cool. Maybe you know what? Let's let's try to be a janitor because he was really funny. He looked like the Bangladeshi version of Mr. Bean. Uh, so he was yeah, he was a funny guy. Um, so you know, I was like, okay, let's try it out. Let's see if I can make something out as a janitor, and then it happened. A lot of sacrifice, a lot, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of time, um, and of course financially, um, every sport is different. But I think at any sport, when you go up to the world level, and the Olympic level, it's gonna cost. Um, so, and I'm not saying if you don't have money, you can't do it. No, there's always ways to do that. Uh, but I think for athletes, what's very important is you have to number one, you have to enjoy what you do. Um, if you don't like it, deep down inside, there's no point because you're forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do. You yourself as an athlete have to, to realize that this is what you want to do. Then that's, that's the first thing that sets your, your motor going to, to keep you, yourself pushing. Uh, and then, should you be the one who wants to do it, um, it's important for you to know what your goal is. Every athlete has a different goal. Some only want to do it for fun to a certain stage. Some want to get to the Olympics. Some want to be world champions. Figure out what your goal is. Again, coming back to, is it realistic? Is it possible? If not, start small first, right? And then, for example, if you, you want to be an Olympian, awesome, great. Figure out how you can be one. Because there's a lot of qualifications, there are a lot of things that you have to go through in order to make it to the Olympic team or to be selected to go for the Olympics. If you don't know how that works, then you're already lost because that's the pathway that you have to follow. Right? If there are certain requirements that you have to do, figure that out, get yourself started as soon as you can so that you're already on that path. Uh, so that's, I think, very important for a lot of athletes, uh, knowing your path. Right? Um, because a lot of us, they, we do it, but then by the time we find out how to get there, it's too late. Right? So understanding the road there. And then for parents, the thing is, they are the driving force behind that. If, if they want their, their kid to go far, then either you commit to it or you don't. Right? It's, and it's a big thing to ask. Um, some parents will try their, their best and sometimes it might not work out, but you know, at least they tried. They, they gave it their all. Um, and then some parents are totally like against sports and all that. Then it's better off the parent talk to the kids and say, this is how we feel, this is how it is. So, there's no mixed signals, lah. Let's put it this way. The kid knows what they're getting into as well, so it's not it's not so like you know you don't feel the impact as hard when you find out later on that your parents actually don't want you to do this, right? Yeah, give them a heads up first, so you know then then they can figure out okay, do I have to work to pay for my my uh, training, or maybe I can do this one because there's a lot of athletes around the world who are actually working to to pay for for their training. You know, like for myself as well when I came here. I, I work as well to keep myself living here. Um, it's just in Malaysia, a lot of us are very fortunate. Parents are always there in the house. So I, there are some cases that you know, some are less fortunate. That's how it is.